Mr. Fox Yuar, Group Chairman of PSA International, Mr. Lucien Wong, Chairman of MPA, Mr. Tan Chong Ming, CEO of PSA International, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. I am very happy to be here today to open Pasir Panjang Terminal, Phases 3 and 4. Singapore has always been a port, even from our earliest days, 700 years ago, in the 1300s, probably when it was still called Tamasi. When the British came in the 1819, Stamford Raffles arrived, he came here specifically to create an emporium, an entrepot in Singapore, to bring goods from the region, to trade them here, to ship them here, to do business, free trade, to serve the Malay archipelago and facilitate, facilitate trade between China and British India. It was both a response and a challenge to the Dutch, who were dominant in the Dutch East Indies, and who were preventing British ships from trading in Dutch-controlled ports in the region, other than one port, Batavia, which is now Jakarta, where the Dutch charged high prices. So being a free port was Singapore's raison d'etre right from the very start. And ever since then, Singapore has been an entrepot. This port started out at the mouth of the Singapore River, Older Singaporeans will remember the old boat key. It's not where you go and have barbecues and drinks, but a place where coolies and stevedores loaded and unloaded through the sweat of their brows. Sacks of rice, coffee, spices, bales of rubber, copra from tongkangs and bum boats. And the cafes and the restaurants today those were the go-downs, the warehouses where the goods were stored. And it was like that until less than 30 years ago. But at the same time, we built up docks at Tanjung Paga, and the Singapore Harbour Board ran the docks. 50 years ago, when we became independent, first from the British and then in Malaysia, and then when we separated from Malaysia, Singapore was still a regional port. We called it an entrepot, trading in raw materials in the region and shipping goods through us from the developed countries back to the countries around us. And not just contain, not, no container ships, not just big ocean liners, even barter traders coming in from Indonesia on sailing boats. And we went for every bit of the business. All of it was important to us. But we saw that our position as an entrepot was under threat because our neighbours were developing or aspired to develop. They wanted to build their own ports and bypass Singapore. They saw us as a middleman. So we had to find other ways forward, and hence we, and particularly Dr. Go King Sui, embarked on industrialization and a modernization of our economy. But at the same time, we continued to invest in our port. We trained our people. We developed a cooperative relationship with the unions. Before that, the port unions, the Singapore Harbour Board Union, had been quite militant and well under left-wing influence. But we developed a cooperative relationship so that workers and the union leaders saw tangible benefits in better wages and upgraded themselves instead of going on strikes. So despite our concerns that the entrepot business was a sunset trade, our port grew year after year. Partly it's because our economy thrived and we were making 8, 10, 12 percent growth every year. But also because we gave good service to our customers. So we attracted more transshipment business. We expanded our hinterland not just Singapore, not just our immediate neighbours, but even countries and ports quite far away from us, all the way to South Asia, all the way to Taiwan, Hong Kong. They too brought cargoes to Singapore to be transshipped. And because we depended so heavily on transshipment, we had to be more competitive, more efficient, more reliable, 
and very careful to avoid losses and damages to goods and do it better than anybody else. I remember I visited the port once in the late 80s and I asked the management, how many containers do you lose? They looked at me in shock. They said, we don't lose a single container. And you handle, at that time, 3, 4 million containers a year. And today you handle 35 million containers, and I think that must still be true. And that's why we made a living for ourselves. I remember one minister from a neighboring country, an old wise man, who told us, says, yes, our businesses use your port. And there are people who are not so happy that you are transshipping our goods. But the fact is, this is a more efficient, a cheaper way to do business, and because of you, our businesses and our countries benefit. It was a very sober, accurate assessment, and the reason why we could make a living. Despite nationalistic emotions, despite the desire of others to take away our cheese. And that's how, by the 1970s, we became one of the busiest ports in the world. And today, we are the world's biggest transshipment hub and the second busiest port in the world. Second busiest after Shanghai. But Shanghai has the benefit of serving the Yangtze River, Del ba Valley, or Yangtze River Delta. And in fact, it has a hinterland of a big part of China. Whereas in Singapore, our domestic base is five and a half million people in Singapore. So it's a remarkable position for our port to be in, and it's not something which is going to stay unless we keep up the effort. I think Singaporeans know that the port is important to us, but I suspect that many of us don't realize how critical it is. If PSA were not one of the major ports in the world, connected directly to other major ports, Shanghai, to Rotterdam, to the United States, to Australia, then we would literally be sidelined on a sideline up a creek. People come to visit you if they have to. If not, you're not in their mind share. It's not just a completely different port. It's a completely different Singapore. But because of the success of our port, the world is highly connected to Singapore, and we are very integrated into the world. So we bring in all our imports, all the things we need, food, clothes, vehicles, necessities, conveniently, quickly, with low shipping costs. And businesses come to Singapore, set up here, use Singapore, their base, for the region. Because they benefit from our extensive shipping network because they benefit from our high sailing frequencies, which cuts down shipping time, turnaround time, and therefore inventory costs. And also because they know this place is clean, efficient, there's no leakage, no pilferage, no money to grease the palm. You pay the rate, and that's it. And because the port thrives, so Singapore thrives. And we have a maritime industry built around the port, which creates many good jobs. The maritime industry in Singapore has 170,000 people employed, and it contributes 7% of our GDP. So how did we get here, despite all our disadvantages? No hinterland, no resources, no natural advantages to begin with, other than location. Not by chance, but through bold and able leadership, long-term planning, hard work. We made major decisions, bold decisions, that paid off in the long run. First, in 1966, we decided to build the first container port in Asia, in Southeast Asia, and commissioned our first terminal at Tanjung Paga in 1972, at a time when the idea of contain containerization was still new. And it was yet to be seen whether this was the wave of the future. We were also one of the first ports to introduce a one-stop paperless computer system, Portnet, back in 1984, linking the shipping community electronically to our port. 
And then later on, as we saw the limits of Tanjung Paga, we made another major decision in 1991 to expand the port beyond Tanjung Paga to Pasipanjang, where we are today. And at that time, our total annual container throughput was 6 million TEUs. I was part of that decision. We had to decide, based on PSA's projections, that one day we will be six times that size. Never fear. Six times six is 36. They said we build for 36. And we had to decide where to put the port, and eventually we decided to put it here in Pasipanjang. And we invested ahead of time and develop new, reclaim the land and develop new terminals here. And it's a decision which has proved right. It's been 25 years since we took the decision, but last year we made 34 million TEUs. So we are close to that, almost reaching our capacity limit. We didn't stop looking ahead, even after deciding to come to Pasipanja. About 10 years ago, in 2004, we planned to expand Pasipanjang further to 50 million so that we could take 50 million TEUs in PSA in Singapore. And the government invested $2 billion of land to reclaim the land for the expansion. PSA itself committed $3.5 billion for new facilities and equipment. And so today, we are opening the new berths at Pasipanjang, phases three and four. These new berths will enable us to serve better mega-sized container ships and make us even more efficient. And now the container ships have 18,000 containers, maybe bigger eventually. We will serve them with automation. The gantry cranes, rail-mounted in the yards, will no longer need crane operators. Instead, you'll have crane specialists monitoring the crane operations and intervening only once in a while where necessary, saving manpower, improving productivity. In the long term, we have further plans beyond Pasipanjang, and we plan to consolidate all of PSA operations into one mega terminal in Tuas. We looked at Tuas before, we were not ready. Since then, we have made more reclamation in Tuas. We've looked at it again. This time, we think we can do a really first-class port from scratch in Tuas. And it will raise our capacity to 65 million TEU, almost double what we moved through the port last year. More importantly, it's a greenfield site so that we can use advanced technology and fundamentally change the way the port is run using data analytics, using autonomous vehicles, using technology, green technology, to sharpen our efficiency, our reliability, and so our competitive edge. And just to keep everybody on their toes, if they look out across the water, not very far away, not even on the horizon, there are some competitors very visible. We are also studying how the port can be redesigned to integrate well with the surrounding development and to be open to the public instead of the traditional mode of a port which is completely out of bounds to the public. So we are now, we are today sitting in a good and happy position because of good leadership and hard work. Our founding Prime Minister, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, and PSA's first chairman, Mr. Hao Yun Chong, had the foresight to start the first container terminal. Mr. Lim Kim San was chairman of PSA for many years, and he led it to grow to become one of the world's busiest ports. Then Dr. Yeo Ning Hong as chairman and Mr. David Lim as CEO under him, expanded PSA's footprint internationally so that PSA operates ports around the world which are linked together in an efficient network. It's not just a Singapore port, but we have ports along the chains, along the strings. The management didn't do it alone. The unions played a critical role. The Port Workers Union, the Port Officers Union. It, the, we are here today much better than where we started, but it has not been an effortless one-way upward rise. There have been difficult times, there have been tough decisions. It has required very close cooperation and trust, working with the unions in order to carry through decisions which were necessary in order to safeguard the success of the port and the future livelihoods of the port workers.
including from time to time loss of jobs. Emotionally wrenching, but in the end, it was the necessary and right thing to do. So I'm very happy that today for this event, we have unions represented here too. I should also mention the MPA, the Maritime Port Authority, the staff and management, who took over the planning and regulatory functions of the maritime industry when PSA was corporatized back in 1997. All of these people, MPA, PSA, unions, workers, supported by thousands of pioneers and generations of port workers who worked tire tirelessly 24-7 to keep the port running. And you saw some of them in the video just now, and there are a few who are in our audience today, including two who worked on the first container ship which arrived in Singapore 1972, 43 years ago today, the MV Nihon. It was such a big occasion, you could see from the video, the girl bagpipers turned up to welcome the ship, all of 300 containers. Mr. Martin Verghese, who's 71 years old this year, and was one of the pioneer group of key crane operators who unloaded the first container of the first vessel. The MB Nihon had come from Rotterdam. Or, and Mr. To Kok Tia, 70 years old this year, who was a work supervisor when MB Nihon came to Singapore. Both of them spent many years in PSA, progressed through the ranks, and now are nurturing and mentoring the next generation of port workers as trainers in the PSA Institute. But it's not just the port workers, but also their families and loved ones that deserve recognition, who are part of the PSA family. Yesterday, I posted a picture of a Tanjung Paga container terminal on my Facebook page. It was quite popular because it's a pretty picture, but also because PSA is an institution in Singapore and has strong support from its community. And it reflected how big a role PSA has played in the lives of Singaporeans. Several people who posted comments on my photo shared that their family members had also worked in PSA. One of them was Jacqueline David, and she wrote that her 65-year-old father, Mr. Wee Xiao Hui, was a long-time PSA worker and container crane operator who also now guides younger operators, and he considers PSA his second home. And she was just one, there were others as well, and I'm happy that they are here today, and we have many of the PSA families with us, families where the father and the son or daughter are both working in PSA, and I think in time you'll have three-generation families as well like Mr. Baba bin Abu Bakar and his two sons, Fizul and Fadili, or Mr. Poakim Soon and his daughter, Andrea. I think they were on the video just now. Indeed, this is a family business, and I look forward to meeting all of the families later on. 43 years ago today, we opened a container port at Tanjung Paga. We didn't know whether it would be a success because the MV Nihon was the first ship which came and it was just 300 containers, not a game changer in itself. But it was the beginning of a game change. And take a look around you, at least when the curtains are open, and you will see how far we have come, how the port has been transformed, so that today we are handling ships with 18,000 containers on one ship and turning them around and sending them back out within about a day. See how people have been transformed from coolies and stevedores unloading heavy sacks of goods by the sweat of their brow to professionals operating advanced equipment running our ports efficiently with best-in-class operations. The world has changed, but we were tenacious in seizing the opportunities. We worked hard, and we've kept our place in it. So thank you all for building up our port to what it is today. Long may the spirit of hard work and bold leadership continue and take us into the future well beyond the next generation.